super excited today for our topic. It's something that I actually was thinking about a lot um, over the last few years, and I didn't really know what it was called or how to explain it. I just had a feeling that it was something that was happening. Um, and so I'm really excited that um, we get to explore that topic in just a minute. But I want to tell you a little bit about the streamlined connection, because, you know, most people don't really realize that getting organized is more than just getting tidy. It's actually the key to freedom and wealth and prosperity. And so when you make the connection that you're doing the organizing to get the result, it's much easier to stay organized in the long run. And I think there's going to be some great uh, discussion about how that plays out um, in the roles of families today. Um, but also it, it's, you know, I found many of my clients have that craving for control at the same time they want freedom and how to match those two. Because really to have freedom, you have to let some stuff go. You have to loosen up just a little bit to get into flow. So we're thinking of organization as that powerful tool to help you get control of that external space so that you have more peace and calm in your internal space. And it's a true reflection of who and how you want to be. And it can also help you scale your business. So I know a lot of my clients run their own businesses. Um, they're entrepreneurs. They're starting something up or they're super busy professionals and they can take the lessons from organization to, into their own work and their own day. So I, it's about creating that nurturing and supportive environment that allows you to do the things you wanna do, whatever that freedom looks like to you. If it's more playing video games or if it's uh, starting a new business empire, either way, organization is the key that helps get it all done. And it's the mindset, the simplicity, and the focus all come together when you have a plan and know what you really want. For those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. I'm actually a certified professional organizer, one of the first to be certified in the world, and a money breakthrough business coach. And so I merged the two because I've been studying how habits affect our results and how money mindset affects our clutter. And it's all connected. So the streamlined connection, right? That's what happened. Today on the show, I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about women, um, women's work, the brain, and emotional labor with my colleague and good friend, Regina Lark of A Clear Path Organizing. And I just can't even wait to see what happens. Hello, Regina. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Miriam. It's so good to see you after all this time. I know. It's been a while. COVID interrupted our usual yearly gathering, and so <laughs> I haven't seen you in almost two, almost three years now. It's going to end up being, that's crazy to me. Crazy. Um, okay, so welcome, and I'm, you just have this new book that's out. Tell me just briefly the, the title of the book and where people can find that so that they have a place to start. Okay, so thank you for letting me talk about this book. I love this book. Uh, it's called Emotional Labor, Why a Woman's Work is Never Done and What to Do About It. And currently, you can find it on Amazon or the Emotional Labor website, and it's emotional-labor.com. And Perfect. you can purchase the book on the website, and I can send you a signed copy, uh, or you can purchase it from Amazon and um, don't get a signed copy. Oh, perfect. I'm super excited about that. Now I wanna tell everyone just a little bit more about you, and then we're gonna get into the juicy nitty gritty details about what the book and your work lately has been about. Um, Regina founded A Clear Path of Professional Organizing and Productivity Service in 2008, and she's been a featured speaker and educator on all kinds of issues, ranging from productivity, hoarding, and women's leadership. Um, she, this is her third book, um, and all of them have been really good. I've read them all. <laughs> um, and she also is a certified professional organizer, and she specializes in, in senior and boomer downsizing um, and various uh, life transitions and residential organizing. She's got that extra certificate that I don't have in chronic disorganization. It's not my preferred people to work with, but she's a whiz at it. Um, and she works with a lot of clients that have ADHD, which I do. 
So um, many of her tips and tricks have, have helped me over the years as well. Um, she's been recognized as one of the 20 best organizing experts on expertise.com and one of the top 10 LA organizers. So I'm super excited about that. But also, I just love the fact that she's also a PhD because, you know, I'm like a, a learning nerd as well, although I never did it formally in that fashion um, in history. And I studied a lot of women's studies and history myself. So we have that in common as well. But it brings a fabulous perspective, especially to this topic, because, you know, <laughs> cult of domesticity all the way up to now. And wow, no. <laughs> it's kind of a mess. So <laughs> right. Emotional labor. Like if you don't even know what it is and you just think about it for a second, everyone, you kind of start getting the the result of it, right? Especially women are going to know exactly what that means. But why don't you give us the the formal working definition of it so we know what we're talking about today? Okay, well, I think the the phrase women's work mm -hmm. resonates more at this point than emotional labor. I still run across people yeah. uh, that don't that they've never heard of emotional labor. And yeah, given given some time and maybe a couple of prompts, uh, they will uh, come up with some kind of a definition. But I think that the phrase women's work, that's universal. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of unfortunate because it actually plays into part of the problem, right? That we have to distinguish. <laughs> yeah. Oh my, yes. I mean... <laughs> There is such a deeply threaded historical legacy. I mean, centuries. Keep going. Centuries old legacy on why the work of the household, which is really household management. Right. Called women's work, right? It's, it's household management. It's actually not women's work. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, I love that. Um, and I can't wait to to explore more of that because that's part of what my thoughts have been on this topic for, for many, many years. Um, yeah, just the terminology. Also, the, the fact that, I don't know if you find this and we'll explore it a little bit more, but the terminology we use helps both keep you disorganized because you're either overly categorizing things and everything has its own label or you're under categorizing things because you have no ability to distinguish anything. Um, and so I think that, that w we can play around with that a little bit more as well. When we come back, we got to take a quick break. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino with the streamlined connection on bold, brave TV network. And when we come back, we're going to continue this discussion with Regina Lark of a clear path organizing about women's work and our brains and emotional labor. And um, we'll be right back. The free one minute mail solution works for email too. And you can download it at the link below or over there. Maybe it's a, the link. I'm here with Regina Lark of A Clear Path Organizing talking about her book, Emotional Labor, Why a Woman's Work is Never Done and What We Can Do About It and Women's Work. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> tell me a little bit about women's work and what defines women's work. Oh, what doesn't define women's work? <laughs> right. What can't we do? <laughs> you know, there's a there's an old saying. I think it's about 147 years old now, and it goes like this. A, wom a man can work from sun to sun, but a woman's work is never done. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Why is it never done? And 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 here's here's one reason that we can point to the work of the household. And again, we're looking we're going to look at household management mm -hmm. as every female that's listening to your podcast knows household management is never ending. Right. It is planning, processing, noticing um, decluttering, organizing, remembering. Are we out of catch up? When are we having meals that are going to require catch up? It's matching mm -hmm. socks. It is um, signing permission slips. It's both the visible and the invisible. Mm -hmm. Machinations of a household. 
Yeah. The same skills that are needed in household management are the exact same skills needed at the C-suite. Or above. <laughs> <laughs> or above, like in my queendom, for example. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it is the same skills as running a kingdom or a queendom and running a business. Like it's time management, it's the executive function skills, right? Mm -hmm. It's 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 the it's the um, it's it's having a healthy relationship to time, to your emotions. That your emotions aren't aren't too flat or too high. It's like running on an even keel. It's being able to plan and process and sequence. It's being able to anticipate what's coming up. And these are all yes. executive function skills. Mm -hmm. All, you know, the, the work of the household, I mean, we can trace this back historically ad nauseum, right? I mean, Aristotle, I got a quote from Aristotle in the book, and I got a quote from Plato in the book, and then mm -hmm. St. Paul. I mean, it's, it's, it's so codified. And I, I have done, you know, 15 week semesters on, on US women's history that document and codify all of the reasons why this work has become focused on women. It's, you know, they're the keeper of the moral flame. It's keeping, um, it's it's the opposite. The, the the genteelness of the household is the opposite of the rough and tumble world of the, of what historians call the public sphere versus the mm -hmm. home, the private sphere. Um, yeah. During period of early American history, this idea of Republican motherhood. It was as if the weight of the Republic was on a woman's shoulders because she was responsible for raising the future citizens of the state. And, and what kind of household do the future leaders of the state have to come from? They have to come from a well-ordered household. And who's responsible right. for the well-ordered household? It's the female of the house. And truly and really, Miriam, in all of my research these last five years, I've only seen two ways in which women are needed to do the labor of the household, and that is giving birth and breastfeeding. Mm, Other yeah. than that, everything else can be done by either. Every everything else can be done by by the adults in the household, and. Mm -hmm. Um, it, the, the, this understanding was born out of a conversation with my client, Sylvia, and she's filled with despair and anxiety. She's got ADHD, unmanaged. She felt like a lousy wife and mother, and she really internalized it to such a degree that we were sitting on the floor in the middle of all the clutter, and I said, Sylvia, Sylvia, just because you have a vagina doesn't mean to the manner born. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, that body part, <laughs> the, the body part you really need is your cranium and a functioning executive function. That's what we need for this work. So the yeah. work household that we call emotional labor is the invisible, the um, unnoticed, unwritten, unwaged, mm -hmm. undervalued, yet highly valued work of the household. Right. So I, um, part of what I've been thinking of the last few years from my experience with my clients, they're always in despair. Like I'm not the perfect Instagram mom or I'm not just like Martha Stewart. Right. Um, and yet I started thinking about it and, you know, I come from the generation, the first generation of latchkey kids. And so our moms weren't really there to teach us. And yet my mom taught me how to run a household and my grandmother taught me how to run a household. But I feel like my peers didn't necessarily teach their children how to run a household. Somewhere it got flipped and they went to work and they tried to be perfect moms and housekeepers and everything and put all this pressure on themselves and did it all for their kids. And now there's another generation of people that don't know how to run a household. Um, and that's unfortunate and yet it shouldn't be our responsibility like it should be how do you set yourself up for success and everybody take personal responsibility for the day-to-day -day chores of life and then you get to expand and, and move off of that would have you found similar insights or sure i i um i think one of the bigger there are many challenges one most okay. people aren't 
aware of what's going to be coming up for them. <laughs> so yeah. just, just the other day, um, I heard somebody say, what we didn't know was what was coming up and we had to be nimble to delegate. So mm -hmm. the book, my emotional labor book, there are several pages that have been uh, that are classified as the emotional labor life cycle. Right. And it starts it starts with the first kiss mm -hmm. and it ends with putting your uh, adult parents into assisted living. Great. It's and we're going to life cycle of life. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about that more when we come back. We have to take a quick break. This is Miriam Ortiz Pino on Bull Brave TV network on the uh, Streamline Connection show. And after the break, we will be talking more about this uh, life cycle and anticipation and preparing uh, right after we come back. The Streamline Clutter Solution online course will help you gain control of your stuff and space. What are you waiting for? The link's around here somewhere. We are talking to Regina Lark of A Clear Path Organizing about her new book, Emotional Labor, Why a Woman's Work is Never Done and What to Do About It. And we were just getting into um, how noticing is a skill and you really have to develop that skill, whoever you are, to be able to run a household, right. whoever you are. So right. let's talk about how... How is not noticing showing up for people? Great question. Not noticing is showing up uh, in families where one person is largely responsible for the labors of the household. Mm -hmm. And if the other adult in the household isn't noticing what needs to be done, then it's going to cause havoc and uh, engender a lot of arguing. And yeah. what I hear a lot is this uh, from the, I'm going to, I'm going to speak in very general terms from the, uh, I'm going to talk about a um, cisgender household, uh, female, male, hetero. And uh, this is what we hear often is that the hetero husband, the male, will say, but she's better at this than I am. And it's because she's raised to notice. She's raised to be better. So hands down, yes, she is mm -hmm. better, but that doesn't promote equity. And what I say to these folks who believe that somebody else is better, yes, they're better. Now go sit in front of YouTube and learn how to do an entire cycle of laundry. Right. I mean, they're better because they do it regularly. They've developed the habit. They've learned some efficiencies about it, but it's practice. And they weren't, I mean, I wasn't born knowing how to do laundry. I had to be taught. Right. But the <laughs> female of the household mm -hmm. will be. So here's something interesting that came out of the research when I looked at um, how emotional labor lands in same sex households. Right. And gender non binary households. And most heterosexual women just are shocked to hear that when two gay men get together and start cohabitating, there are no pre-described gender roles. They have to have discussion about what the hell to do in the household. I love that it never even occurs to them that it, that's not how it is. It's, it's going to have to happen. Marian. Yeah. And, <laughs> and where the shift happens, and so there's always... Um, from what I've, from what the research has shown, from the beginning of same-sex relationships, there is always conversation about who's going to do what when, mm -hmm. and and if both are not good at it, whatever task it is, they either figure out, they figure it out, or they outsource. Oh, yeah. immediately. Yeah. They delegate, and so. And this is the same in, in uh, female and male same-sex couples. Where the big shift happens, where these families begin, these, these households begin to resemble more uh, hetero, is when uh, children start coming in. Yeah. Then 
there's these other discussions of who's going to stay home and, you know, who's going to carry the fetus. And, you know, I mean, there's all these other discussions that have to, that, that are being created. But initially, they talk about how to divide the household labor. And it turns out that I think if gay men are capable of wiping down the countertops every night, then right. surely hetero men should be capable of right. wiping down right. the countertops. Like right. if it was their precious car, they might wipe it down daily. It's, it's, it's the same as a countertop. <laughs> There's a really great um, guy that I met in my research named Matthew Frey, and he is um, he's this guy in Ohio that got divorced a number of years ago. He's been a blogger for a long time, and uh, he was when when she left him, uh, he he assumed that she left him because he left the cup on the counter, mm -hmm. and he was just like, "What the hell is her problem?" Until over a couple of years after his divorce, he realized it was many cups on many counters and that he, mm -hmm. he, he understood that he discounted her. He, he did not um, take into account um, what she valued, what was important to her. Mm -hmm. and, and he's in a relationship now and he tells this interesting story about, so his new partner, um, uh, I'm gonna speak very generally, works from home every Thursday. Mm -hmm. and, uh, on this particular Thursday, she was going to be out on off site at a client for the whole day because he has learned to notice and to observe her, not in any freaky codependent way mm -hmm. as a partner. Yeah, he notices. So when she says, oh, I'm going to be gone all day Thursday, he goes, oh, OK, I know that on Thursdays you also do this. Would you like me to take that over for you today? As she it should be. Ask. You know what I mean? She didn't have yeah. to ask. She, he, she is very visible to him. Mm -hmm. And he is very visible to her. I love that. That was one of my favorite parts of the book was his story and his realization and the dawning on him. And it just proves that people can learn to be, to notice things, to be aware, to begin anticipating the needs of your partner and your family um, and the house um, I love that. Yeah. 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 So, so again, it's, it's, you know, it is the noticing that's important and it is, it is the constant communication, the, um, the emotional labor life cycle in the book. I'm encouraging couples to look at it and then find where you are. Are right. you kids? Do you have, kids? um, mm -hmm. you know, find out where you are so you can begin to anticipate what's coming up and the conversations you really ought to be having now. Yeah, I, I found it interesting when I realized a couple of my clients who had kids hadn't ever planned what would change in the house when the kids arrived. Mm -hmm. And so um, I bet you find it all the time because all organizers do, but you go to work in a nursery or clean up a kid's room and all the parents' memorabilia and clothes are still in the closet because the kid's too young to notice. It's like, we well, got to give your kids some room, people. <laughs> they got to grow into it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's all piece of that. Um, we're going to have to take another break and uh, we'll be back in a minute. But um, I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network. And when we do come back, we're going to go into ways you can get out of feeling the resentment of, a of emotional labor and, and create some more equity. Um, perhaps using those life cycles. Um, I'm Mary Martizzi Pino, and we'll be right back. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. And we were just starting to get into looking at the, the life cycle, all of our life cycle, and where we are in it, and how that can help inform what kind of work we should all be doing in our household, whether it's the women's work or the men's work or just the work. work. It's Basically, work. it's just we work. Just call it work. <laughs> it's life maintenance. It's household maintenance and management. And it is the stuff we all need to kind of be able to do for ourselves in case something happens. But when it builds to that point of resentment, like, um, I can't remember the guy's name. Is it Matthew? Yeah. Um, 
like he realized it's not just the cup on the counter that one day. It's the fact that he's been doing it for years yeah. and the resentment built up. And what happened? I mean, I, I see it all the time, that revenge disorder as well. Um, and so how do you get out of the emotional labor madness a really, really good mental health practitioner. Mm, yeah. When that who who understands the gender dynamics at home, mm -hmm. uh, who really can um, hone in on um, where the anger and resentment is coming from, because at some point there's going to be anger and resentment. And what I've been hearing. And I'm and I'm trying really hard to keep my um, anxiety about these couples. Uh, what I'm hearing is, well, you just have to pick your battles. Oh. He, he's a good person, you know. He does all of these things, and 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 I think that's lovely and generous. I I get that, but 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 a lot of women will then spend years in that slow burning seething you know it stays beneath yes. the surface it'll erupt so one of the things that i'm encouraging couples to do and this is a an easy doesn't require a whole lot of thought it's mm -hmm. non-confrontational because you hear you know uh, there's one of the cartoons in the book <laughs> Honey, will you do this? And then the last panel is, you know, her outrage. I have come. You can't put this away. Right. One quick and dirty exercise is for the two adults in the household to go into separate rooms and then write down everything they believe they do that contributes to household management. Yes. Everything. Just write it down. No filters. Even if it seems silly or that's not that important, I do it, whatever it is, mm -hmm. just write it down. It's so important to start with being oriented as to where you're at. So what's going on. So you Absolutely. can change from right. there instead of this random, we're actually over here versus we think we're up here. Right. You got to start and at the right place. Lists without mm -hmm. labeling, judging, or resenting. Right. It's just tasks. It's just it's just to see. And mm -hmm. once once it's in front of it's like I, I have um, we have a, a, a 15 employees here at a clear path and twice a year we do employee evaluations mm -hmm. and the evaluation is to the self. You know, my right. perception of myself, my perception of what the company could do for me. And my mm -hmm. perception of my coworkers, and right. all of these allow me as an employer, right? I'm managing my company, not unlike managing a household, not unlike managing a corporation with hundreds of employees. What these evaluations do for me is to help me guide the rest of the conversation until the next evaluation. Right. It gives everybody something to strive for. It gives some motivation. It gives feedback. It gives it's an opportunity for praise and learning and expansion and shifting, and shifting yeah. to do something else. And so when I look at these um, emotional labor lists without labeling, judging or resenting each other, mm -hmm. just look at the list. And, and then the next step in that is what what are the tasks that either one of us are doing that have to be done? Right. And then how can that have to be's become more evenly distributed? Yeah. It's then, that distribution that's so hard. <laughs> what? What? If, if there are tasks that neither one of them likes and, mm -hmm. and only one of them is doing, how important is it really? Is it right. important enough? Is it, it is it is it anxiety provoking enough to just take it off the table, or mm -hmm. is it important enough to do that? And here comes another conversation about who's going to do it. One one example is that I hear a lot 
um, is the Christmas card list. Right. The Christmas card list is usually done by one person mm -hmm. and includes all the kin and friends and of, of both adults. Right. So yeah. how important is the Christmas card list? And if it's important, how do you equitably distribute the labor of that? Because as you know, in and of itself, sitting down and writing Christmas cards could be a lovely thing by a fire with a hot toddy and you know, mm -hmm. you've got your special Christmas stamps and it could be a lovely thing. But if it becomes a gotta get the cards out. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah, I actually, one of my best friends and her husband, they're, they're, they were building some resentment about that fact and they <laughs> turned it into a couple's retreat every year. Nice. And now they go and they rent a little, you know, uh, Airbnb or something, and they spend the day doing it together in front of a fire with a drink nice. and a good meal and a bunch of baked goods, and they do it together. And so they almost always write the the exact same number of cards, and then they do the production of putting them in the envelopes and stuff. So wow. I love that. What a great workaround. See, again, yeah. it's... it's it's what's important. Yeah, that kind of communication with our family and friends, really important. Does it have to fall on one person's shoulder or what's, I love that work around. And, and yeah, it's creative too. It's creative and um, they, they, it's as if they outsourced it to themselves. Exactly. <laughs> and made it um, a vacation. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately on that note, we got to take another break, but we'll be back and continue this conversation. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino on the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network. And after the break, we'll continue where we left off. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. One of the points you make pretty well in the book, too, is it doesn't have to look like hiring someone. It can be more creative than that, or it can be just a letting go entirely of some of the stuff. So tell us a little bit about some of the the ways you've seen work well for for delegating the work. I want to talk a bit about delegating before delegating. Right. <laughs> um, I, you could knock me over with a feather when I've, as I've learned how many women do not delegate because of the fear mm -hmm. that it, it, it brings up. There's fear of, here are the fears. Well, I, you know, I have to explain it. And so I might as well do it myself because I'm afraid that if I don't, it just won't get done. So I'm going to do it. I'm afraid that the person won't be able to follow my direction. I'm afraid of losing control. I'm afraid there, there are myriad fears that come up mm -hmm. and we talk about delegating and, and if we are going to get out from under this burden, this heavy heavy burden yeah emotional labor a couple of things have to happen and one of them is to become really really friendly with the art and practice of delegation and for me mm -hmm. this starts with trust and that may sound i don't know how i don't really care how it sounds for me one of the reasons why I have great success. One of the reasons why I'm able to uh, publish a book and don't let, I need to talk about my work with Judith Kohlberg. It's really yeah. important to um, this book. But one mm -hmm. of the reasons why I have a great company, why I'm able to become a professional speak. One of the reasons why I'm able to do all these great things is because I am the queen of delegation. Girl, mm -hmm. If I if it's not my skill set, I delegate. And I've been doing this for the 13 years I've been in business. And so when I started a clear path in 2008, I did it all. Mm -hmm. I did I I learned how to do a profit and loss statement. I can't add a column in numbers. It was always off. I learned how to do my website on GoDaddy. I did everything. But as I began to bring in a little bit of money, after I was able to feed myself, mm -hmm. 
the first thing I delegated was the bookkeeping part. And my former partner, Linda, became the bookkeeper. And she didn't charge me a lot of money. Then the website. And Barb has been working on my website for 12 years. And mm -hmm. again, she wasn't charging a lot of money. And she still doesn't. But I knew that. And then, and then I hired an assistant um, to do social media. Again, I'm, I'm able to find people to work at a particular price point that I'm comfortable with. So right. trust that, trust mm. yourself that your instincts are right and you will find the perfect person. No, a good person. It doesn't have to be perfect. A good right. person to delegate this to. Then also trust. Uh, so then there's trust and then come up with a price point. Mm -hmm. What to you is a good number to delegate. And I get a number in my head. Right now I'm looking for a book publicist. There's a right. number in my head. Yeah. I'm interviewing a lot of book publicists. Their yeah. prices are all over the place. All over the place. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing my due diligence. And the reason I'm able to interview is because I delegate all the other stuff in my life. So again, it's it's mm -hmm. I understand that delegating is not easy, but I really implore your listeners to take a big, strong look at that because mm -hmm. once we can start delegating, start with the things that are benign, that won't have a terrible outcome if it's not done. Yeah, but, someone to rake the leaves or someone to, you know, whatever, wash the windows outside. Yeah, or Right, whatever is on your task list. Mm -hmm. And then also practice um, the art of good enough. Yeah, that one's hard. <laughs> um, and yet it's so freeing when you start doing, you know, true confession. I'm a little bit of an OCD cleaner. So when I start cleaning, I can't stop. Like I'm in there with a toothbrush and a toothpick. So my house is not always clean. It's always organized and the clutter's picked up, but it's not always clean because if I start, I need a lot of time. Right, right, right. Um, so it's one of those weird dilemmas. Like, so it's taken but me see, years and years. Thing. Yeah. You know you need this right. block of time. Yeah. And it's <laughs> it's the the pre-planning, the anticipation. Yep. And um, it's so empowering to make the choice based on actual criteria instead of just assuming or out of resentment and revenge. Um, like so many of these decisions are empowering if you get better at it. And it, it's just like women's work. It takes practice, dudes. You gotta practice it to get good at it. So women, we need to practice delegating to get good at it, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, all of it. All right, so let me tell me. It about Judith. Um, yeah, I wanna hear her. Listeners may know her. Uh, she is a thought leader in our industry and mm -hmm. she is, um, smart and um, educated and she uh, is a book coach and she's an author. She's got amazing books. I love her. I love her authorship. And uh, I, I could I could wax eloquently about my love affair with Judith Kohlberg's um, written word. And so mm -hmm. in uh, June of 2020, I uh, realized there was two or three days in a row that I was not sitting down and writing my book. Mm -hmm. I had all the research. I've been doing research for years. That was yeah. kind of, it wasn't happening. And I called Judith. We're friends. And I said, hey, I'd love to hire you for inside the back, inside the front cover to inside the back cover. Mm -hmm. Miriam, it has been the most joyfully collaborative experience. Love it. I don't, I'm not a collaborator. I'm a, I'm a, I just march to the beat of my own drummer and I do my own thing. Mm -hmm. Bringing in a collaborator was significant. And if anybody that's listening to this podcast believes they have a book in them, please reach out to Judith Kohlberg. I cannot say enough or reach out to me and I'll tell you about the experience. Yeah, no, I love that. I love Judith as well. And someday my book will have her help. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we've got... Uh, to take one more break and then we are going to come back and, and do a wrap up and, and make the connections. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network and we'll be right back. Get the Streamlined Time Solution online course and learn easy ways to control your time and tasks. Links here somewhere, down there I think. 
I want to just get kind of a recap and a, a wrap it up with a bow kind of what you think the overall aha things from working on this book and, and all your research into emotional labor and, and women's work, what, 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 what's the bottom line of it? There's, there's a, it's a big bottom line. First, mm -hmm. um, to recognize the work of the household as work. Right. That it's household management. It's not women's work. There's, a, there's actually a technical name for it. It's household management. Uh, second is to uh, work on your communication skills with the other adult in the household and to be able to share an understanding of what the work entails. And so going off and making your own list about what you do and then coming back together and talking about it and how to create more equity in the household. Three, mm -hmm. get good at delegating. Yeah. And four, become okay with good enough. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no, it's perfect. It's a great way to wrap it up because I, the next thing I usually do is make the point that we talked a lot about this from a household management perspective, but again, it's the same skills you need in C-suite or above. And so what can you take from this lesson and apply it to your work life as well, right? What is the um, communication piece that you can take? What is the um, procedure uh, lesson that you can take from defining what the tasks actually are to help you delegate more in your business or at your home. So the same kind of thought process is the mindset that takes you from feeling overwhelmed and anxious and stressed to a more organized, calm method of being in the world. It's the same, whether it's at home or at work or when you're having fun on vacation. So take those lessons and it is almost always those same lessons, right? Where are we in the process? What needs to be done? Who's gonna do it? And how can I get out of it? Exactly. <laughs> right? It's the same thing. The more things um, change, the more they stay the same. Exactly. All right, so Regina's book again is called Emotional Labor, Why a Woman's Work is Never Done and What You Can Do About It. And you can find it at her website or at, oh, you have a lovely little tiny URL.com slash BJ366U4. Well, Amazon. Yeah, the, the Amazon is unwieldy in terms yeah. of links. So if you type Regina Lark in Amazon, you will see You'll that book. Exactly. All right, so next time on the show, I will be speaking with my colleague, Geraldine Thomas, about <laughs> the perfectly imperfect presentation. Um, as always, comments, feedback, and questions are welcome. You can send those to me at miriam at morethanorganized.net and tell all your friends because we all know that getting organized is way more fun when we do it together instead of in isolation. And in the meantime, have a delightful day.